"'I have come for the gift of truth,' Danny said. "'In the long hall, the things I saw, were they true visions or lies? Past things or things to come? What did they mean?' "'The shape of shadows, morrows not yet made. Drink from the cup of ice, drink from the cup of fire. Mother of dragons, child of three. Three? She did not understand. Three heads has the dragon. Hey everyone, Crow Food's daughter here. And if you click this video, you have reached the Disputed Lands. In today's video, we will be hashing out part two of our Azora High prophecy analysis. This will be best understood if you have viewed part one, as well as my video on King's Blood, as we will be building on a few established concepts. Links to both videos can be found in the description box below, so be sure to check those out. And if you've already watched those videos, you are in for a treat because I left you on a bit of a cliffhanger in part one. So with that in mind, we will be exploring the identity of the third head of Azor High, what makes them a dragon, and how they will fulfill this prophecy, all while bringing forth the evidence, references, and clues that have been sprinkled throughout the series, which may surprise you. Now let's get started. So, the third head of the dragon. In part one, we examined the Targaryen obsession with the Azor Ahai prophecy, as well as the fandom's confusion relating to this hero's identity. It was through this analysis it was noted that within the prophecy itself, this long-awaited savior is referred to as a dragon. Furthermore, once you understand that this prophecy is describing Azor Ahai as a dragon and its implications, something else becomes much more significant. The dragon having three heads. This somewhat cryptic phrase is repeated in very profound ways by Rhaegar in Danny's House of the Undying Vision, by the Undying Ones themselves, and by Maester Aemon on his deathbed. And this presents us with a very new possibility, because if this hero is referred to as a dragon, and the dragon has three heads, then we may be looking at the possibility of three prophesied saviors, not one. This in turn would help to make sense of our two very strong contenders for Azor Ahai we have within our story and would suggest that in place of debating which of these two characters would best fit the role of Azor Ahai, we should understand them as both fulfilling this role, and we should instead turn our attention to the identity of the third head. And with those concepts in mind, based on our analysis in part one, there are some assumptions we can make about the identity of the third head. This third head should fulfill the Azor Ahai prophecy, the third head would also have to be a dragon in some sense, and given that there are three dragons within the storyline, this third head would likely also be our third dragon rider. And keeping this in mind, I do believe we can determine the identity of the third head, although you might not be happy with the answer. It is my belief that the third head of the dragon is Euron. Now, let me explain because there is one important thing that we do need to discuss, the nature of one aspect of the original Azor Ahai. You see, the hero from the Long Night that we know of as Azor Ahai might not have been a completely good guy. You see, there is a pretty good chance that one aspect of the original Azor Ahai was not a good guy at all. Even before the publication of the World Book and before learning about the Bloodstone Emperor, there were readers questioning the legend of the last hero. Yet here and there, in the fastness of the woods, the children still lived in their wooden cities in hollow hills, and the faces in the trees kept watch. So as cold and death filled the earth, the last hero determined to seek out the children, in the hopes that their ancient magics could win back what the armies of men had lost. He set out into the Deadlands with a sword, a horse, a dog, and a dozen companions. For years he searched, until he despaired of ever finding the children of the forest in their secret cities. One by one his friends died, and his horse, and finally even his dog, and his sword froze so hard the blade snapped when he tried to use it. As discussed in my Broken Swords video, the last hero is likely part of a collection of legends that make up the Azor High monomyth. 
because not only do we have a man fighting the others and ending the long night, but we also see a broken sword being highlighted in his legend as well. And if you look at the tale of Azor Ahai, it is said his sword broke twice before he tempered his blade into the heart of Nissa Nissa. But the main thing readers have been questioning isn't the last hero's association with Azor Ahai. That's the easy part. What readers have been questioning was his association with the Night's King. The gathering gloom put Bran in mind of another of Old Nan's stories, the tale of the Night's King. He had been the thirteenth man to lead the Night's Watch, she said, a warrior who knew no fear. And that was the fault in him, she would add, for all men must know fear. A woman was his downfall, a woman glimpsed from atop the wall, with skin as white as the moon, and eyes like blue stars. Fearing nothing, he chased her and caught her and loved her, though her skin was cold as ice, and when he gave his seed to her, he gave his soul as well. He brought her back to the night fort and proclaimed her a queen and himself her king, and with strange sorceries he bound the sworn brothers to his will. For thirteen years they had ruled, the knight's king and his corpse queen, till finally the Stark of Winterfell and Joramun of the Wildlings had joined to free the Watch from bondage. After his fall, it was found he had been sacrificing to the others. All records of the Night's King had been destroyed, his very name forbidden. So there are a few things in this tale that just don't seem to add up. First, according to this legend, the Night's Watch appears to have already been well established as the Night's King is already the 13th Lord Commander, and it appears the Wall has already been built. But if the Wall is already built, and the Night's Watch is already well established and on its 13th Lord Commander, then it would be assumed that the Long Night had already ended and the others had already been defeated. But if this is the case and the others were defeated, then why would the Night's King be sacrificing to the others? And why would there be a woman who seems to be something similar to another, with skin as cold as ice and white as the moon and eyes like blue stars? What many have come to conclude is that these events could have only happened before the fall of the others, or said another way, during the long night, not after. And interestingly enough, like the Night's King, the last hero is also associated with the Night's Watch. According to the World Book, in the North, they tell of a last hero who sought out the intercession of the children of the forest, his companions abandoning him or dying one by one as they faced ravenous giants, cold servants, and the others themselves. Alone he finally reached the children, despite the efforts of the White Walkers, and all the tales agree this was a turning point. Thanks to the children, the first men of the Night's Watch banded together and were able to fight and win the battle for the dawn. As you can see, the last hero is linked to the Night's Watch in his legend as he is said to have enabled the Night's Watch to band together to win the War for the Dawn. Additionally, the last hero was said to have set out into the Deadlands with a dozen companions, and as his journey went on, his companions died one by one, leaving the last hero as the thirteenth. So with both tales, we have two men living around the same timeline of the Long Night, and also living around the same place, and both are associated with the Night's Watch while one of these men was the thirteenth companion of a band of men who were searching for a way to end the Long Night, while the other was said to be the thirteenth Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. You can see several similarities, right? And just as the Night's King's name was erased from history, we see our last hero is also without a given name. And this was before the publication of the World Book. After the publication of the World Book, well, gasoline was added to the fire with the tale of the Bloodstone Emperor, where readers have found several parallels to Azor Ahai and the sacrifice of his wife Nissa Nissa. And what is interesting here is that with the retellings of both The Last Hero and Azor Ahai, we are being given stories that have echoes in the tales of the Night's King and the Bloodstone Emperor. Now, looking at this from the context of the dragon having three heads, if there is a possibility Azor Ahai was less than heroic, such as the Night's King or Bloodstone Emperor, well then it's possible we might need to bark up a different kind of tree when exploring the identity 
of the elusive third head. Keeping this in mind, let's take a closer look at the Bloodstone Emperor, a man said to have been the younger brother of the Amethyst Empress, who later grew envious and cast her down and slew her in order to inherit rule. He cast down the true gods and practiced dark arts, torture, necromancy, and took a tiger woman for a bride. And with Euron particularly, it's quite clear his character has been given heavy allegory to the Bloodstone Emperor as well, as he also killed his older sibling and later gained rule. He's an incredibly dark and sadistic person who is perfectly okay with torture. We see Euron is dabbling in dark arts, and just as the Bloodstone Emperor was said to have cast down the true gods with Euron, we get passages like this. The bleeding star bespoke the end, he said to Aaron. These are the last days when the world shall be broken and remade. A new god shall be born from the graves and charnel pits. Then Euron lifted a great horn to his lips and blew, and dragons and krakens and sphinxes came at his command and bowed before him. Kneel, brother, the crows I commanded. I am your king. I am your god. Worship me, and I will raise you up to be my priest. Never. No godless man may sit the sea stone chair. Why would I want that hard black rock? Brother, look again, and see where I am seated. Aaron Dampere looked. The mound of skulls was gone. Now it was metal underneath the crow's eye. A great tall twisted seat of razor-sharp iron, barbs, and blades, and broken swords, all dripping blood. Impaled upon the longer spikes were the bodies of the gods. In Aaron's shade of the evening vision, we find Euron telling his brother to worship him, that he is his god. Then Aaron sees all the gods imaginable, from the drowned god to the seven to the lord of light. Even more troubling is that Euron is moving from a symbolic casting down of the gods in a vision to a more literal one through his upcoming sacrifice of several priests of different faiths. Another parallel you might not have noticed is that he is seeking Daenerys Targaryen for a bride. And as I discussed in my Maze Maker video, the Tiger Woman the Bloodstone Emperor took to wife was likely referring to the Amethyst Empress. Interestingly, Daenerys has several Amethyst Empress qualities, and there have been a lot of Amethyst Empress comparisons that have been made to Daenerys, particularly when examining the language Euron uses in her description. Duran Durandon has a great essay called Daenerys is the Amethyst Empress Reborn that I've linked below for a deeper dive on the topic, which is something that we will be circling round to. So Euron is not only killing his sibling to usurp a throne, dabbling in torture and dark arts, and casting down the gods, but he is also attempting to take to wife the character who most embodies the Amethyst Empress, just as the Bloodstone Emperor had. Well, we are off to a pretty good start, but if Euron is, or is to become, one of the three heads of the dragon, he is going to have to fulfill the prophecy in some way. And with that being said, let's take a closer look at the prophecy itself. According to Melisandre, the prophecy states, When the red star bleeds and the darkness gathers, Azor High will be born again amid salt and smoke to wake dragons out of stone. So far, it doesn't seem that Euron has accomplished any parts of this prophecy, but there is no doubt that Euron is up to something terrible and arcane with his upcoming sacrifice. The dreams were even worse the second time. He saw the long ships of the Ironborn adrift and burning on a boiling blood-red sea. He saw his brother on the Iron Throne again, but Euron was no longer human. He seemed more squid than man, a monster fathered by a kraken of the deep his face a mass of writhing tentacles. In Aaron's dream, we have a boiling blood-red sea with the ironborn ships adrift and burning, which would very much be a literal scenario of salt and smoke, and it might even be the closest approximation to the prophecy we have seen so far. But Aaron isn't the only one being sent visions. In this next passage, we see Makoro has experienced similar visions, but instead of a boiling blood-red sea, he sees Euron sailing on a sea of blood. Have you seen these others in your fires? He asked warily. Only their shadows, Makoro said. One most of all, a tall twisted thing with one black eye and ten long arms sailing on a sea of blood. Melisandre also sees something similar when she is praying to Rolor 
for a vision of Azora High, saying, Show me your king. Show me your instrument. Let's take a look. Stannis was marching south, into peril. The king who carried the fate of the world on his shoulders, Azora High reborn. Surely Relor would vouchsafe her a glimpse of what awaited him. Show me Stannis, Lord, she prayed. Show me your king, your instrument. Visions danced before her, gold and scarlet flickering, forming, and melting, and dissolving into one another. Shapes strange and terrifying and seductive. She saw the eyeless faces again, staring out at her from sockets weeping blood, then towers by the sea, crumbling as the dark tide came sweeping over them, rising from the depths. Shadows in the shape of skulls, skulls that turned to mist, bodies locked in lust, writhing and coiling and clawing. Through curtains of fire, great winged shadows wheeled against a hard blue sky. Now this is pretty interesting. In this scene, we see Melisandre is praying for a vision of her lord's king and instrument, and in response, among other things, she is given a vision of towers by the sea, with a dark tide rising from the depths. Although Melisandre would come to interpret that she was seeing a vision of Eastwatch by the sea, Melisandre is also subject to misinterpretation of her visions, and the fandom has some other ideas on what the dark tide rising from the depths could be referring to, and one of the main contenders for this dark tide is Euron and the Ironborn with their upcoming battle for Old Town. Old Town is the second largest city in Westeros, but it is also home to the most famous tower of all, the High Tower on Battle Isle. In Brand 5 of A Clash of Kings, we see how the invading Ironborn can be symbolically presented to the reader as a dark tide, or in Jojen's case, black waves. Tell me the bad thing you dreamed, Bran said, the bad thing that is coming to Winterfell. Does my lord prince believe me now? Will he trust my words no matter how queer they sound in his ears? Bran nodded. It is the sea that comes. The sea? I dreamed the sea was lapping all around Winterfell. I saw black waves crashing against the gates and towers, and then the salt water came flowing over the walls and filled the castle. So, when examining Melisandre's vision more closely, in comparison to Jojen's dream, it appears the dark tide sweeping over towers by the sea was likely a vision of the Ironborn invasion of Old Town, and the most fascinating aspect is that this was presented to her after praying for a vision of Azora High. And since we're on the topic of Melisandre's misinterpretation of things, in my video on King's Blood, we examined the concept of King's Blood and its relationship to the Azora High prophecy and waking dragons from stone. This ultimately led to the discussion of the God Kings of ancient past. The topic of God Kings and the nature of their regency becomes very significant in regard to the interpretation of the Azora High prophecy which Melisandre claims is 5,000 years old. As discussed in my video, there is something of a difference between what a king is now in the present timeline and what a king was around the time the prophecy was written. Because 5,000 years ago, at the time it was written, a king was believed to be directly connected to the gods and higher powers, or in some cases, they were believed to be gods themselves. We see this reflected in the histories of Martin's world that retell of the god kings of Ebb, the God Empress of Lang, the God Emperor of E.T., the God on Earth of the Great Empire of the Dawn, the High Priest of the Church of Starry Wisdom, and so on. And so, when examining the prophecy with the concept of King's Blood in mind, it's possible that Melisandre may have the wrong idea. She believes she needs the blood of a king, when in reality, holy blood, or the blood of someone connected to a higher power, may at least be part of what is needed in order to fulfill this prophecy. And when we examine the funeral pyre where Danny had hatched dragons from stone, we see that holy blood was very much present as Mary Ma's door is a priestess. In Daenerys I of A Clash of Kings, Danny thinks to herself about the price she had paid for her dragons to be brought into the world. A living dragon is beyond price. In all the world there are only three, Every man who sees them will want them, my queen. They are mine, she said fiercely. They had been born from her faith and her need, given life by the deaths of her husband and unborn son, and the magi, Mary Mazdur. 
So, according to Danny, her spouse, her unborn child, and a holy person, she is telling us it was their deaths that had paid the price, and it was their deaths that resulted in dragons hatching from stone. Now, what you might not have caught is that the very same elements will be present in Euron's upcoming sacrifice as well, as we see Folly of Flowers is pregnant with Euron's unborn child. And what is truly terrifying is that although Melisandre may have the wrong idea, it appears Euron may know exactly what he's doing. Then, when we take a closer look at Aaron's vision, we are being given a clue that Euron may have the Azor Ahai prophecy in mind. The bleeding star bespoke the end, he said to Aaron. These are the last days when the world shall be broken and remade. A new god shall be born from the graves and charnel pits. Then Euron lifted a great horn to his lips in blue, and dragons and krakens and sphinxes came at his command and bowed before him. In this passage, we see Euron is referring to a bleeding star, which is an element of the Azor Ahai prophecy, and it's a sign for the return of Azor Ahai, and he used the correct wording. While this could be a simple coincidence, what is instructive to the reader is the next line. These are the last days. Now, the prophecy is a prophecy about a hero, yes, but in a sense, it's also an eschological one, or an end of days prophecy. It's not just foretelling the rebirth of Azor Ahai, but it's also foretelling the world falling into darkness and the second coming of the Long Night. Next, Euron states that the world will be broken and remade, which is reminiscent of how Benero preaches of Azor Ahai. Benero has sent forth word from Volantis. Her coming is the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy. From smoke and salt, she was born to make the world anew. She is Azor Ahai returned, and her triumph over darkness will bring a summer that will never end. Death itself will bend its knee, and all those who die fighting in her cause shall be reborn. Do I have to be reborn in the same body? asked Tyrion. The crowd was growing thicker. He could feel them pressing in around them. Who is Benero? There does seem to be some parallels here. After Euron mentions the Bleeding Star and Last of Days, he follows that up by stating that the world will be broken and remade, while Benero preaches of Azor Ahai making the world anew. And we also see a common theme of death and rebirth, where Euron declares that a new god will be born from the graves and charnel pits, while Benero mentions that death itself will bend its knee, and those who die fighting in its cause shall be reborn. So in this passage with Euron, mentioning a bleeding star, then the end of the world, and something reminiscent of how Benero preaches of Azor Ahai, when added together, this should set off a few red flags. Now, we're at about the halfway mark, and so far we've discussed the third head of the dragon, and how this third head might not be the heroic version of Azor Ahai we've come to expect, and could represent the more nefarious aspect of Azor Ahai, found in the Knight's King and Bloodstone Emperor legends. In identifying this, we examined the heavy parallels Euron shares with the Bloodstone Emperor in particular. We have also discussed the concept of King's Blood and waking dragons from stone, and compared this to the contents of Euron's upcoming magical sacrifice. And if Aaron's Shade of the Evening Vision is any indication, then there's a good chance Euron may be aware of the Azor Ahai prophecy as well. Then, when we examine Melisandre's vision, of a dark tide sweeping over towers, we see this vision may be in reference to the upcoming invasion of Old Town, which was sent to her when she had asked for a vision of Rolor's king and instrument. But with that being said, there is one slight problem. As discussed, according to Maester Aemon, the prophecy itself refers to this hero as a dragon, which would make sense of the Targaryen obsession with this prophecy and explain Maester Aemon's assumption that this hero would have the blood of the dragon. It must be you. Tell them. The prophecy. My brother's dream. Lady Melisandre has misread the signs. Stannis. Stannis has some of the dragon blood in him, yes. His brothers did as well. Rael. Egg's little girl. She was how they came by it. Their father's mother. She used to call me Uncle Maester when she was a little girl. 
I remembered that, so I allowed myself to hope. Perhaps I wanted to. We all deceive ourselves when we want to believe. Melisandre most of all, I think. So, I'm not sure if you noticed, but Euron doesn't have any blood of the dragon. Euron isn't a secret Targaryen or a secret Blackfire. He isn't even a secret Valyrian. Euron is Euron, a Greyjoy of Pike, born from the loins of Quellon Greyjoy. So, you can call him a lot of things. Ironborn, Iron Man, Pirate, Reaver, Squid, Kraken. But he is no dragon. Furthermore, if his intention was to wake a dragon from stone, like Danny had, it wouldn't be useful to have a dragon that size this far along in the plot. You just don't get a rideable dragon as soon as it hatches. It has taken years for Danny's dragons to crow the size they are currently. Plus, if Euron's intention was to wake a dragon from stone in Old Town, why would Euron send Victorian to Essos, on the other side of the world, with the Dragonbinder Horn? It seems Euron is trying to become a dragon rider. That is how Euron told the Ironborn he would be conquering the Seven Kingdoms. But from what we've seen so far, with Dragonbinder being sent to Marine, he is in the market for one of Danny's full-grown models, which Euron has already expressed. And if the books are to parallel the plot twist of the third dragon rider in the show, it seems as though Euron might even be successful in these attempts. So, it doesn't make much sense if Euron's end goal in performing this sacrifice is to obtain an actual dragon, because he's already got that base covered. So, with that being said, if Azora High is described as a dragon, I would like to pose two questions. First, how is someone without the blood of the dragon able to be the third head of the dragon? And second, if Euron is not trying to wake a dragon from stone, what ritual is he trying to perform, and what is he trying to accomplish? Well, the answer's pretty easy. Euron has already told us his objective. In Aaron's Shade of the Evening Vision, Euron is declaring that a new god shall be born. Then he makes the statement, I am your king, I am your god, and commands his brother to worship him. So it's not hatching dragons that Euron is planning. It's something else. By declaring that a new god shall be born, followed by a command of his brother to worship him, it appears this new god Euron is speaking of is in reference to himself, or rather, his future self. If deification or becoming godlike is his goal, then this is likely the intent of the arcane ritual he is about to perform, a ritual of ascension or transformation of sorts, with the intention of becoming godlike which, if viewed from this understanding, would help to explain this very peculiar line from A Feast for Crows. You have sons, he told his brother, base-born mongrels, born of whores and weepers. They are of your body, so are the contents of my chamber pot. None is fit to sit the sea stone chair, much less the iron throne. No, to make an heir that's worthy of him, I need a different woman. When the kraken weds the dragon, brother, let all the world beware. What dragon? said Victorian, frowning. The last of her line. They say she is the fairest woman in the world. Her hair is silver gold, and her eyes are amethysts. But you need not take my word for it, brother. Go to Slaver's Bay, behold her beauty, and bring her back to me. An heir worthy of him. This is a line that has fascinated a number of readers, because really, who is Euron referring to? Who is him? When we look at the context of the conversation, it is confusing for Euron to speak in third person, as this is a break in character. We have seen dialogue from Euron in several chapters, and it isn't like Euron to refer to himself in such a way. This one word has raised a plethora of speculation, but from what we see in the context of this passage, he does seem to be referring to himself, as Euron intends to take Daenerys for a bride with the intention of producing sons. However, after examining this passage, with the knowledge that he is attempting to become a god or a deity, when Euron is saying an heir worthy of him, this means Euron is not referring to himself, but rather he is referring to that which he is about to become. And now this is where it gets interesting. 
George R. R. Martin has acknowledged on several occasions how Tad Williams's Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn series had inspired him to write the A Song of Ice and Fire series. I am a huge fan of Tad Williams. Although I loved Tolkien for many years, I had pretty much stopped reading modern fantasy since so much of it was awful derivative stuff. Then I tried Tad's Dragonbone Chair and sat up and said to myself, yes, this genre can be terrific in the hands of a good writer. I would likely never have written A Song of Ice and Fire without that inspiration. Gray Area has been talking about the parallels between A Song of Ice and Fire and Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn on her YouTube channel, and her Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn videos detailed several parallels found in both series. For example, there are several parallels where the series' influence can be seen, from a comet appearing, portending doom and change, to the threat of an unusually long winter, to a bad guy who wears a helm in the shape of a hound. But the crux of the message in her videos is that we may have been looking at the Azora High prophecy all wrong. In regard to prophecy, George R.R. R. Martin has said that prophecy needs to be unexpected. Things shouldn't be too literal or too easy, and this should come as no surprise, because within the series itself, he has been telling us all along that prophecy should be looked at with suspicion and questioned. From Tyrion telling us that prophecy is a half-trained mule that will kick you in the head, to Marwyn comparing prophecy to a treacherous woman who will bite your prick off. He's been telling us don't trust it. Keeping this in mind, one of the things Grey Area noticed in her video was the Storm King in Aluki and his forging of the Blade Sorrow, and its similarities to the forging of Lightbringer. But beyond the swords themselves, she had also noticed parallels between Azor Ahai and Inaluki. Inaluki was a Sithi prince who was determined to beat back the unstoppable forces of men, and in doing so, had unleashed a dark forbidden magic in the forging of sorrow. The making of this sword disfigured and changed Inaluki's essence, making him a dark foil of the man he once was, changing his persona into the Storm King, who was set on destroying all humanity. The dark magic he had unleashed, however, would eventually become his own downfall and death. The only problem is, is that even though the Storm King was killed, he didn't completely die. A part of his soul, a flicker of his bodiless spirit, lived on in the between realms of the spirit world. And worse, his return has been prophesied. He has waited five centuries to take back what he feels is his, and his hand is colder and stronger than any of you can understand. But wait, there's hope. A prophecy states that there is a way to defeat the Storm King. All you have to do is bring the three blades, known as Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn together in one place, and the Storm King can be defeated. But the only problem with that is, is that if all swords come together, that is exactly what the Storm King wants. The prophecy is wrong, and instead of defeating him, it will do the opposite. It will instead bring on his return. And Elias, a man who was reaching for power and immortality, will be used as the vessel for the spirit of the Storm King to live on. Now this is how you subvert the prophecy trope of fantasy literature. Instead of a prophecy telling you how the Dark One will be defeated, by following it, you are actually bringing on his return. So with that being said, with the knowledge of how the Storm King returned in Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, and the knowledge that Euron intends to become a god, let's return to the question I posed earlier. How is someone without the blood of the dragon able to be the third head of the dragon? The answer to this question is even more terrifying than we realize. The only way for Euron to be the third head of the dragon would mean that Euron would have to become a dragon. It appears Euron is intending to awaken and become one of the original aspects of Azor Ahai, the man known in legend as the Knight's King or the Bloodstone Emperor. And with that in mind, let's go back to Benero preaching about Azor Ahai. Benero has sent forth the word from Volantis. Her coming is the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy. From smoke and salt, she was born to make the world anew. She is Azor Ahai returned, and her triumph over darkness will bring a summer that will never end. Death itself will bend its knee, 
and all those who die fighting in her cause shall be reborn. Do I have to be reborn in the same body? asked Tyrion. The crowd was growing thicker. He could feel them pressing in around them. Who was Benero? Do you see it? Directly after we get this information about Azor Ahai, that seems to echo Euron's comments in the Forsaken chapter, the very next line, we have Tyrion asking if you have to be reborn in the same body. And that's not all. In the Forsaken chapter, we have Aaron calling Euron a demon in human skin. And when we look at the Storm King character of Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, we can see Euron's character appears to have been given allusions to the storm as well. In the Prophet chapter of the Feast for Crows, after learning of Balon's death and Euron's return to the Iron Islands, Aaron tells us, I have seen this storm, and its name is Euron Crow's Eye. Then, in the Iron Captain chapter, Euron tells us that the storm god swept Balin to his death, but in reality, we know that Euron was responsible for this, so that which he attributed to the storm god was actually his own doing. So in a sense, by saying that the storm god had swept Balin to his death, he is referring to himself as the storm god. Then, in the Reaver chapter, we get this line. Lise will not welcome us, nor will Volantis. Where will you find fresh water, food? The first storm will scatter us across half the earth. A smile played across Euron's blue lips. I am the storm, my lord. The first storm and the last. So it seems Euron's character may have been given some nods and winks to the Storm King of memory, sorrow, and thorn as well. Then, when you re-examine Euron speaking in third person, if you put two and two together, we are being told what he is about to become. You have sons, he told his brother, base-born mongrels, born of whores and weepers. They are of your body. So are the contents of my chamber pot. None is fit to sit the sea stone chair, much less the iron throne. No, to make an heir that's worthy of him, I need a different woman. When the kraken weds the dragon brother, let all the world beware. What dragon? said Victarion, frowning. The last of her line. They say she is the fairest woman in the world. Her hair is silver gold, and her eyes are amethysts. But you need not take my word for it, brother. Go to Slaver's Bay, behold her beauty, and bring her back to me. In this passage, Euron is telling his brother to bring back Daenerys from Slaver's Bay, and she is being given a descriptive nod to the Amethyst Empress, with her hair of silver gold and eyes of amethyst, which parallels Danny's Wake the Dragon dream, where she was given a vision of her ancestors, described as ghosts dressed in the faded raiment of kings, with hair of silver and hair of gold and hair of platinum white, and their eyes were described as opal and amethyst, tourmaline and jade. So, if Daenerys is being given the Amethyst Empress language, and Euron wants to make her for his bride, well then, it would make sense if the him Euron is referring to is the Bloodstone Emperor. And when Euron tells Victarion, when the Kraken weds the dragon, let all the world beware, at face value, he would obviously be referring to marrying Daenerys, but knowing that Euron is also referring to that which he is about to become in this passage, this may be another hint, because although to wed does mean to marry, it also means to combine or bring together. So when the Kraken weds the dragon, let all the world beware. Additionally, the failed Targaryen attempts to fulfill this prophecy appears to be another clue. If you recall, in part one, we discussed the Targaryen obsession with Azor Ahai and the prince that was promised and noted that there were at least two Targaryens who thought they themselves would be transformed into dragons. The Targaryens never bury their dead. They burn them. Ares meant to have the greatest funeral pyre of them all. Though, if truth be told, I do not believe he truly expected to die. Like Arian Brightflame before him, Ares thought the fire would transform him, that he would rise again, reborn as a dragon and turn all his enemies to ash. Over there, in that urn, the ashes of Arian Targaryen, Arian Brightflame, they call them. He thought drinking wildfire would turn him into a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> he was wrong. 
As mentioned in part one, knowing that Azor Ahai is referred to as a dragon, if one were to read this prophecy in the literal sense, this might explain the peculiar belief Arian and Ares both had that they themselves would be transformed, reborn as dragons upon their fiery deaths. And while they didn't quite get it right, their beliefs in these temps can, in a sense, inform us how this prophecy can be interpreted as a transformational rebirth, a reawakening as a dragon within the person. Another expertly placed hint can be found in this line of A Feast for Crows, when the reader, Roderick Harlaw, is speaking to Asha concerning Euron. Archmaester Rigney once wrote that history is a wheel, for the nature of man is fundamentally unchanging. What has happened before will perforce happen again, he said. I think of that when I contemplate the crow's eye. This, as many readers have pointed out, is a wheel of time reference, as Robert Jordan is the pen name for James Rigney, who wrote the Wheel of Time series. And we have Archmaester Rigney in A Song of Ice and Fire, writing that history is a wheel, which, at face value, is a fun Easter egg and a nod to a fellow writer. However, after knowing what we know about Euron, this is just another clue, because the prophesied savior of the Wheel of Time series foretold to break the world is known as the Dragon Reborn. And according to the prophecy in this series, we have Azor Ahai Reborn. But if he is referred to as a dragon, then another way of saying it would be the Dragon Reborn. And like the Dragon Reborn in the Wheel of Time, who is foretold to break the world, we have Euron stating that the world will be broken and remade. So, in reality, this is more than just an Easter egg. This is our author covertly giving us another clue. And what is even more thought-provoking is that the show may also be providing us with another clue. But before we venture into this territory, we have to first understand that the show changed a lot of things. I mean, the sinister Night King or Night's King hasn't even showed up in the books as a character in the present timeline. Euron is just a corny pirate with a watered-down plot. Young Griff was never present. Sansa took some of Jane Poole's arc, Jorah took some of John Connington's arc, and the Old Town plot was almost non-existent. I mean, there were a lot of changes that were made. But knowing this, once these changes are identified, there are some things that we can take away from these differences. For example, the third dragon rider, or the third head of the dragon in the show, was the Night King, who is believed to be the show's adaption of the Night's King of Long Night Legend. In regard to the show, this Night King is your third act villain. He's the evil bad at the climax the protagonist has to defeat in order to effectively save the world from darkness and endless winter. But the problem with the Night King and comparing him to the books is that his character is so far unique to the show, as his counterpart, the Night's King, hasn't showed up in the books and so far has only been mentioned in legend. And it is because of these differences that many in the fandom view the Night King as a character solely adapted for the Game of Thrones TV show. Now, it's not hard to figure out who the front runner for the third act villain in the book series is, even though the Night King has yet to appear with only two books left. Our third act villain seems to have already presented himself. I mean, have you read the Forsaken chapter? And if Euron is the third act villain, this might explain why Euron's character had been so watered down for the show, and why the Night King had absorbed some of Euron's arc. Because one of the major twists of the Night King in the show was his stealing of a dragon, which, as we've previously discussed, is something Euron has his sight set on doing. I know as much of war as you do, Crozai, Asha said. Aegon Targaryen conquered Westeros with dragons. And so shall we. Euron Greyjoy promised. That horn you heard I found amongst the smoking ruins that were Valyria, where no man has dared to walk but me. You heard its call and felt its power. It is a dragon horn, bound with bands of red gold and Valyrian steel, graven with enchantments. The dragon lords of old sounded such horns before the doom devoured them. With this horn, Ironman, I can bind dragons to my will. So, with Euron's character, 
It seems his third act villain status was given to the Night King of the show. And just as the Night King was the third dragon rider after stealing a dragon, it seems Euron might also be our third dragon rider. And if true, then Euron would in fact be the third head of the dragon. Not any secret Targaryen or any other character you want to see ride a dragon. Just like the show, the third head is going to be the last person you want to see riding a dragon. But when you really think about it, if Euron's intention is to reawaken and become this nefarious spirit such as the Night's King or Bloodstone Emperor, if this is the case, that would mean that the Night King in the show and Euron in A Song of Ice and Fire are closer in character than we realize, and they are in fact both rooted in the same legendary figure. And with that out of the way, there is still one more aspect of the prophecy to discuss, which will in turn tell us where this conjuring of Azor Ahai will occur, the Stone Dragon. According to the prophecy, Azor Ahai will be born again amid smoke and salt to wake dragons out of stone. Stone. Euron will awaken this dragon from stone. So, how does that happen? Well, when Danny is in the House of the Undying, she is given a number of visions, but one in particular should have our attention. From a smoking tower, a great stone beast took wing, breathing shadow fire. A stone beast took wing from a smoking tower. According to the prophecy, this spirit, this third head of the dragon, would have to either literally or metaphorically be awoken from stone. And here, we are given a vision of a stone beast taking wing from a smoking tower. And when we take a look at the Reaver chapter in A Feast for Crows, we see Euron has also referenced a tower in a very cryptic way as well. Euron stood by the window, drinking from a silver cup. He wore the sable cloak he took from Blacktide, his red leather eye patch, and nothing else. When I was a boy, I dreamt that I could fly, he announced. When I woke, I couldn't, or so the maester said. But what if he lied? Victorian could smell the sea through the open window, though the room stank of wine and blood and sex. The cold salt air helped to clear his head. What do you mean? Euron turned to face him, his bruised blue lips curled in a half smile. Perhaps we can fly, all of us. How will we ever know unless we leap from some tall tower? The wind came gusting through the window and stirred his sable cloak. There was something obscene and disturbing about his nakedness. No man ever knows what he can do unless he dares to leap. There is the window. Leap. Victorian had no patience for this. His wounded hand was troubling him. What do you want? The world. Firelight glimmered in Euron's eye. His smiling eye. We have Danny with a House of the Undying vision seeing a great stone beast taking wing from a tower. And we have Euron speaking cryptically about a tower. So, let's talk about towers. As you may already be aware, the High Tower of Old Town is a towering ancient structure that rests at the base of a mysterious and even more ancient structure composed of fused black stone, and is situated at the top of Whispering Sound on Battle Isle, a region that according to Maesters, was settled even before the coming of the first men. Men have lived at the mouth of the honey wine since the Dawn Age. The oldest runic records confirm this, as do certain fragmentary accounts that have come down to us from maesters who lived amongst the children of the forest. One such, Maester Jellico, suggests that the settlement at the top of Whispering Sound began as a trading post, where ships from Valeria, Old Gis, and the Summer Isles put in to replenish their provisions, make repairs, and barter with the elder races. And that seems as likely a supposition as any. Yet mysteries remain. The stony island where the high tower now stands is known as Battle Isle, even in our oldest records. But why? What battle was fought there? When? Between which lords, which kings, which races? Even the singers are largely silent on these matters. I'm not sure if you noticed, but our author has planted some information that, although vague, might actually be useful. 
We are told even at the beginning of written history, the island where the high tower is situated has been known as Battle Isle, and not much other information is given, but we do know that an ancient battle took place that was significant enough to give the island its name. In Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, the reawakening of the Storm King occurs at the place of his death, which is a very tall tower known as Green Angel Tower. Green Angel Tower has several parallels with the High Tower in Old Town. Both are incredibly ancient. Green Angel Tower is located in Hayholt, the ageless castle, which means High Keep. So we have Green Angel Tower of High Keep and the High Tower, which serves as the keep for House High Tower. In A Song of Ice and Fire, the High Tower is the tallest tower in the known world. And when we take a look at Green Angel Tower, it's pretty much the same. We see it is also a fantastically tall tower, and protagonist Simon believes it is probably the tallest tower in all of Ostinard. But beneath the Hayholt and Green Angel Tower rests an endless maze or labyrinth of underground tunnels and passages, which seems to parallel the maze that can be found at the base of the High Tower. Knowing Melisandre sees a dark tide washing over towers by the sea when she asks for lore for a vision of their king and instrument, along with Danny's vision of a great stone beast taking wing from a smoking tower, and Euron speaking cryptically about dreaming of flying and leaping from a tower, and knowing that the high tower might be influenced by the Green Angel Tower where the spirit of the Storm King was reawakened, it's quite possible the high tower is Euron's intended target for his ascension. And because we are given some information about a mysterious battle taking place on Battle Isle, if our author is intending this as a parallel to the other series, then Battle Isle may have been the place where this evil aspect of Azor High was eventually brought down. And Melisandre telling us that Dragonstone is the place of smoke and salt may just be another clue, because another name for the fused black stone material found at the base of the high tower is Dragonstone. In fact, the fused black stone fortress might be more important than the tower itself. Even more enigmatic to scholars and historians is the great square fortress of black stone that dominates the isle. For most of recorded history, this monumental edifice has served as the foundation and lowest level of the high tower. Yet we know for a certainty that it predates the upper levels of the tower by thousands of years. As we have already discussed, the few stone fortress predates the high tower and is shrouded in mystery. So if Euron is to conjure the spirit with the intention of becoming a god, it seems as though this mysterious dragonstone base might be the key in unlocking this dragon from stone. But whether the key rests in the high tower or its base, the result would still be the same. Euron will have awoken a dragon from stone. And what is fascinating is that once this has been identified, it becomes clear that this has been covertly relayed to us this entire time. Because in a sense, what Euron will be doing is opening a door or a gate in order to waken a trapped spirit. And George R. R. Martin has employed a repeated phrase in Aaron's point of view in order to associate Euron with opening doors, the rusted hinge. Even a priest may doubt, even a prophet may know terror. Aaron Dampere reached within himself for his god and discovered only silence. As a thousand voices shouted out his brother's name, all he could hear was the scream of a rusted iron hinge. The rusted hinge is a phrase repeated numerous times throughout the Prophet, the Forsaken, and the Drowned Man chapters, and it is often described as a rusted iron hinge screaming. The repetition of this phrase in relation to Euron is done in a way which causes the reader to associate the rusted iron hinge with his character specifically, and the way that it is employed gives off an aura reminiscent of Martin's earlier work as a horror writer. And when you examine the other times this phrase is utilized, you will see some common themes of prisons, dragons, and towers. Although the Aaron chapters began in A Feast for Crows, the screaming rusted iron hinge began to appear in A Storm of Swords when Davos was freed from his imprisonment. 
Lamprey thrust a great iron key into the lock, turned it, and pulled open the cell. The rusted hinges screamed in protest. You, he said to Davos, come. Where? Davos looked to Sir Axel. Tell me true, sir. Do you mean to burn me? You are sent for. Can you walk? In Tyrion Eleven of A Storm of Swords, we see Tyrion has escaped his confinement after being falsely accused of Joffrey's death and was being led through the underground tunnels and passages of the Red Keep, the last of which led below the Tower of the Hand, with a final door being opened leading to freedom. The juncture was otherwise empty, but on the floor was a mosaic of a three-headed dragon wrought in red and black tiles. Something niggled at Tyrion for a moment, then it came to him. This is the place Shay told me of, when Varys first led her to my bed. We are below the Tower of the Hand. Yes. Frozen hinges screamed in protest as Varys pulled open a long closed door. Flakes of rust drifted to the floor. This will take us out to the river. So here we have Tyrion being released from his imprisonment, with the door to freedom being described as a long closed door, and we see the door is screaming in protest, just as the door did in the previous passage, almost as if the door doesn't want to be opened, or as if the door shouldn't be opened. And we also have a tower in this passage, but what is underneath this tower is the interesting part, because underneath the tower we find none other than a three-headed dragon. Interestingly, in John 10 of A Dance with Dragons, we find Cregan Karstark is imprisoned as well. It took the guards some time to open his cell, as ice had formed inside the lock. Rusted hinges screamed like damned souls when Wick Whittlestick yanked the door wide enough for John to slip through. A faint fecal odor greeted him, though less overpowering than he'd expected. Even shit froze solid in such bitter cold. Jon Snow could see his own reflection dimly inside the icy walls. In one corner of the cell, a heap of furs was piled up almost to the height of a man. Karstark, said Jon Snow. Wake up. Although we don't see Cregan being freed in this passage, instead, we find him being awoken. And we do find a common theme of imprisonment or confinement, with a door opening to the sound of rusted hinges screaming. And this time, it is described as screaming like the souls of the damned. But people aren't the only ones being confined behind rusted iron hinges. Beyond the screams of those hinges, dragons can be found imprisoned as well. In the Spurn Suitor chapter, Quentin is contemplating Danny's words regarding the dragon having three heads, and he has resolved to steal one or both of the dragons beneath the pyramid. Later, we find Quentin and company are beneath the pyramid, setting their plan into motion, and they've broken the locks securing the door. Archibald Ironwood grasped the iron doors and pulled them apart. Their rusted hinges let out a pair of screams for all those who might have slept through the breaking of the lock. A wash of sudden heat assaulted them, heavy with the odors of ash, brimstone, and burnt meat. It was black beyond the doors, a sullen Stygian darkness that seemed alive and threatening, hungry. So we have Quentin attempting to steal, or in other words, free a dragon from their present confinement, and when the iron doors open, their rusted hinges scream. But when they enter is the interesting part. When they enter, at first they can only find Rhaegel. Viserion is sleeping within the stone of the pyramid. The foundations of the Great Pyramid of Marine were massive and thick to support the weight of the huge structure overhead. Even the interior walls were three times thicker than any castle's curtain walls. But Viserion had dug himself a hole in them, with flame and claw, a hole big enough to sleep in. And we've just woken him. So, after the scream of the rusted hinges, we find Quentin is not only trying to free these dragons from their compartments, but we also find that Quentin has awoken a dragon from stone. Which is interesting. Of course, another use of the rusted hinge can be found in Bran III of A Storm of Swords, where Bran and company enter the tower known as Queen's Crown to take shelter from an oncoming storm. Queen's Crown is a tower built on an island and surrounded on all sides by water, which seems to be a parallel to the high tower, which is also found on an island and surrounded on all sides by water. And within Queen's Crown, they discover one floor that 
is a maze of cells. And when they reach the top of the tower, Bran makes the statement that he was hoping to see the wall from its height, which is reminiscent of the high tower, rumored to be so tall that you can see the wall from its heights. And it is in Queen's Crown where Bran takes over the body of Hodor for the very first time. So, in case you haven't noticed, with the screaming rusted iron hinge, our author seems to be hinting that Euron will be opening a metaphorical door, or a gateway of sorts. We have Davos being released from his imprisonment, we have Tyrion escaping from his imprisonment, we find a three-headed dragon beneath a tower, we have Bran entering a tower with heavy allegory to the High Tower, with Bran taking over the body of Hodor. We find Cregan Karstark being imprisoned and being awoken with hinges sounding like the screams of damned souls. And after contemplating Daenerys's words regarding the dragon having three heads, Quintin attempts to loosen a dragon from their confinements. And in doing so, he finds himself awakening a dragon from stone walls which is all likely hinting toward Euron attempting to do the same. Although, unlike Quentin, Euron may be successful in opening this long closed door and waking a dragon from stone. And in doing so, Euron will have fulfilled this prophecy, making himself the third head of the dragon and a demon in human skin. Well, that about wraps things up for today. Thank you so much for sticking with me on such a long format video on a theory that is not necessarily new. Both Genghis Kazoo and David Lightbringer have theorized and suggested such possibilities respectively. However, I hope that the new evidence brought forth today has shown some light on the topic. All references and recommended reading can be found in the description box below. And if you like my video and want to help my channel, be sure to leave a comment and hit the like button. And if you're interested in more videos like these, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. My next video will be discussing how Euron will accomplish this goal and what House Hightower is up to. Thank you so much for watching.